Fantastic. Okay, right. So I think we're going to jump into our, our third speaker, Dr. Vanessa. Dr. Vanessa um, is a current GP trainee, but actually coming to the end of GP training. And we're very lucky to have uh, Vanessa on board of this. She does uh, lots of stuff for us already in terms of medical education. She's been to Belfast and taught on our PLAB training courses. She's done uh, AKT stats webinars. A lot of you guys might have attended a stats webinar um, for the previous exam. She'll be doing uh, hopefully another one for the January exam coming up as well. She used to be a, a core surgical trainee. She used to be involved in the Gibraltar Football um, Association and the national team there. Um, she's done lots and lots of cool things. So she's going to talk all about uh, MSK orthopedics in general practice because this is what her previous role used to be almost, and her, her passion is in MSK. She, when we talk about MSK, she always uh, lights up and she can tell it's a, a passion of hers. So Vanessa, we're gonna hand it over to you. Welcome, thank you for coming on board. Excellent, thank you. So let's get started. Um, so thanks very much for the introduction. Um, and so why is MSK health important? Um, well, NHS England tells us that poor MSK health has a huge impact on people, their employers, the NHS, the wider economy, over 30 million working days are lost due to MSK conditions every year in the UK. And they account for 30% of our consultations in general practice. So it's really important to have a good understanding of MSK in our setting. So I spoke to some of my previous colleagues um, from my orthopedic days and I told them about this talk and I asked them what they thought would be helpful for us to learn about today and we came up with a list of hot topics together. So some of the conditions are common, others less so, but they're all important and hopefully they help us in our MSK practice. So what we'll be doing over the next 30 to 45 minutes is running through five clinical cases. So two relating to the shoulder, two relating to the knee and one to the ankle. So let's start with the shoulder. So we've got a 19 year old male university rugby player who's had a recent possible left shoulder dislocation reduced at pitch side from what he's describing to you. He never attended A&E, no follow-up was arranged, and he's had ongoing vague discomfort since the injury, but no significant pain. He feels the shoulder might give way in certain positions, but no other joints are affected. There's no neck pain, no elbow, hand or wrist pain, and he's got normal sensation and power that he's reporting in his upper limbs, and he's right hand dominant. So you examine him using a look, feel, move approach, which is what we typically do in orthopedics. So you're looking from the front, uh, from the side, and then looking behind. So you're looking for any deformity, any swellings, any scars, any skin changes, any muscle wasting. You're looking at the attitude. How is he holding his shoulder? Is he comfortable or does he look like he's in pain? And on examination, everything looks normal. So then you start to palpate. So you start um, at the sternoclavicular joint, um, and you move your way along the clavicle, reaching the acromioclavicular joint to so the ACJ. And I usually ask patients if they have any pain or tenderness in there, which could indicate pathology like arthritis. And at that point, I get them to do a scarf test, which is where you ask the patient to adduct and reach across to the other shoulder as if they're putting a scarf across their neck. And if when they do that, if they get pain in the ACJ, then that again might indicate that they have arthritis, for example, at that joint. You then palpate, um, but everything's normal in that patient when you test the, the ACJ. You then feel along the, um, the anterior joint line. So you, you feel at the glenohumeral joint anteriorly, you feel in the bicipital groove, everything feels fine. There's no tenderness there. So at that point, you ask the patient to do some screening movements. And normally I say, can you reach behind your head? And can you reach um, just to the lower aspect of your back like this? And when you get the patient to do this, when he does this movement, he's, he stops you and he says, oh, it, it's uncomfortable, I don't like that. You then carry on testing movement. So you get him to do abduction, so to abduct um, and try and reach as far up as he can. And um, you ask him to tuck his elbows in towards his body and you test external rotation and internal rotation. And then you also test flexion um, and extension of the shoulder. And the really important thing is to always compare with the other side. So if there's any restriction in movement, always compare with the other side for that comparison. Um, so again, when you examine and you do his, his movements, um, the, only, um, so the only sort of discomfort he has, again, is on external rotation and, and abduction. So when he does this movement, he really doesn't like it. He's neurovascularly intact, and when you screen the joint above and the joint below, so the C-spine and the elbow, um, there's normal range of movement and there's no pain. So then you move on to some special tests. So um, 
I start with um, the rotator cuff when I'm doing special tests. So uh, super, if we start with supraspinatus, um, it's called the empty can test. You, you may have heard of it before. So I ask the patient to just abduct to about 60 degrees um, and then put a, a downward pressure. So you can see, see here the white arrows are the examiner putting a, a, a downward pressure. Um, and you ask the patient to resist this. Um, and if they get any, any pain when they're doing this, it indicates there might be um, a supraspinatus tendinopathy. If there's weakness, then you're thinking there might be a tear. But this is normal in this patient. You then test subscapularis, um, which is responsible for internal rotation. So you can do this by either asking the patient to tuck their elbows in towards their body again and push in um, and resist um, that movement. So again, the examiner is pushing away, as you can see with the white arrow, and the, the patient's push, uh, pushing in. And if they report pain, again, you're thinking tendinopathy. If there's weakness, you're thinking there's a tear. And again, always really important to compare with the other side. The other way you can do this is by doing a lift-off test. So you ask the patient to reach behind their back and push your hand away as you, as you push in towards them. And then to test external rotation, you again ask the patient to bring their elbows in, tuck them into their body and push you away. And again, you're looking for pain and or weakness. But in this patient, everything's normal. So then the ne next test that I do is a Hawkins uh, test if I'm looking for impingement. So I usually do this, especially if the patient's reported pain um, when you test their, their middle arc. So when you ask them to do abduction, um, when you're doing your, your look, feel, move approach, when, you, when they abduct, if they get pain in the middle arc region, which is between about 60 and 120 degrees, then you think there might be impingement at the subacromial joint. So if we look at this diagram here, um, this is your humeral head, this is your glenoid, this is the acromion, this is a clavicle, and this is the subacromial space where you have the subacromial bursa and supraspinatus tendon. So what happens sometimes is that these structures can become squashed and irritated, and irritated as the humeral head um, abducts and that subacromial space narrows. So if somebody's complaining of a painful middle arc and you're suspecting impingement, you can get them to do a Hawkins test where you, you put their uh, shoulder in this position and then you ask them to adduct and, um, uh, and internally rotate like this in sequence. And I normally help the patient do this just by supporting their shoulder and holding their hand. But essentially they're doing this movement to see whether that um, causes further impingement, reproduces their symptoms. So then when you do this test, it's normal in the patient. There's no, there's no abnormality or pain detected. Uh, next is the long head of biceps test. So we've got speeds test here and Jurgensen's test. So speeds test is where you ask the patient to extend their elbow. And as the examiner, you push down and ask the patient to resist this by trying to flex. And Jurgensen's test um, is where you um, ask the patient to give you a handshake. So you, you hold them in a handshake position with the shoulder at about 90 degrees, more or less. And you do resisted supination and resisted pronation movements. So if they have pain on resisted supination, but not on resisted pronation, that's a positive Jurgensen's test, suggesting that there might be a, um, a long-headed biceps tendinopathy. Um, when you do speeds test, again, if, if, if when the examiner's um, pushing down and the patient's resisting this by trying to flex. If that's painful, again, then that's a positive test. But in this case, that's all, it's all normal in your patient. So then you, you move on to um, labral tear and slap test. So slap stands for superior labral anterior posterior tears. And I normally do this with O'Brien's test. So I ask the patient to internally rotate, rotate their shoulder adduct and then as the examiner, I put a downward pressure and ask the patient to resist this. If that's painful, I then repeat the test with the hand in supination, as you can see here. Oh, sorry. As you can see here in this photo. And it shouldn't be painful in supination, but it, it might be painful in pronation, as you can see here in this photo, if they have, um, if they have a slap tear. But again, this is normal in your patient. So now you move on to instability tests. And this is where you start to see some abnormalities. So you ask the patient to sit down, you support their shoulder with one hand and with the other hand, you try and, um, and, and get the um, humeral head um, and uh, move it forward in an anterior jaw test or backwards in a, in a posterior jaw test to see if there's any give or any laxity. Um, and you, you could, it feels a little bit lax anteriorly when you do this. 
Then you do the apprehension relocation test. So it's really important that you're really careful when you do this test because you're putting the shoulder in an unstable position and you don't want your patient to dislocate. So I normally ask the patient to lie back on the examination couch and you ask them to do, um, to do this movement, which is kind of abduction external rotation. So um, I normally hold the patient's hand and do it very, very carefully with them, just watching their face, asking if they're okay. And as you're doing this, the patient really doesn't like this and he, he stops you. So then you put some pressure um, on the anterior joint and you ask the patient, is that better? And he says, yes, that, that feels better actually. Um, so that's a positive apprehension relocation test. So just at this point, just from the history and from the examination, does anyone have any idea of what might be happening with this patient? Just checking, Dr. Rora, can everyone still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We're just waiting for some uh, some comments to come through if they do. Great, thank you. And it's fine if you're not sure. That's that's why we're doing this case, and we'll run through it on the next slide. Uh, that's okay. Well, we can we can run through it um, together. Nothing and obviously, if anyone has any, but nothing had come before. No problem. If there's any questions, just feel free to post in the chat. We can go through them at the end. So the likely diagnosis here is anterior shoulder instability. So. This, is, this can happen following anterior inferior dislocation uh, from a force during this abduction and external rotation movement. Um, and it can lead to recurrent um, anterior instability because the structures around um, the glenohumeral joint can become damaged. And it's important to remember that you can also get lesions such as a, a bony bank cut, which is where um, the bony part of the glenoid is damaged, or a soft bank cut, where the soft part of the, the glenoid rim is damaged. Um, or a hill sacs lesion, which is where the, um, the humeral head is damaged. And this happens during the dislocation. Um, so obviously you can imagine that because of the damage, these patients can then feel unstable um, after the injury. So check your local pathways always, because they can vary depending on where you work. But these patients need to be referred either to the fracture clinic or the acute shoulder clinic. So for example, this patient had um, the case we just discussed, he had an injury pitch side, um, and um, he was reduced there and then, and then he went home. This patient should have gone to, to A&E ideally. So if you see somebody like this, you need to, you need to send them in to the fracture clinic. Um, so there they'll have imaging appropriately and um, they may require arthroscopic stabilization depending on the extent of the injury. So any suspected suggestion of persisting dislocation or subluxation when you're actually examining somebody it needs immediate referral to A&E. So if you think they're not in joint, this needs to be seen in A&E straight away. If you've got somebody who presents more like this case where they've had a first time traumatic dislocation, um, but they've not been seen in A&E and they, they come to you feeling unstable, um, then they need referral to either an acute shoulder clinic or fracture clinic. And that's because any defects um, are easier to manage if they're acute. If you leave them and they get prolonged gross instability, this can lead to degenerative changes in the shoulder. And remember, a painless shoulder can still be unstable. So in, in this case, the patient wasn't in pain. He was just reporting that it felt odd and it felt like it might give way and he was apprehensive with certain tests. You can also get non-traumatic shoulder instability. Um, and a lot of the time, this, is, this happens in younger, especially female patients who have either connective tissue disorders or they might just have general laxity um, and you normally pick this up because they're generally quite lax um, and you can do a Baton score which we'll talk about a little bit later on to pick up generalized hypermobility but that's why it's important to always compare with the other side um, and these patients can be referred non-urgently to the shoulder team or um, it, they might benefit from a course of physiotherapy before you refer them on. Any persisting instability symptoms, either in a, somebody who's previously dislocated and been seen in A&E and then in fracture clinic, um, uh, but they carry on feeling unstable, or somebody who's a recurrent dislocator, um, they all need to be referred, also, although they don't need to be referred um, acutely. So that's our first case. Um, let's try another case. So 33-year-old female swimmer, deep left shoulder pain for six months and a clicking sensation left hand dominant, it's affecting her ability to swim, the pain is worse on activity, there's no weakness reported, no history of dislocation or trauma and no other joint problems. So again, we go through our look, feel, move approach. Um, on inspection, there's no obvious deformity of the shoulder. Um, 
on palpation, the only thing that you notice is that when you palpate along the glenohumeral joint and when you feel specifically in the bicipital groove, there is some discomfort on palpation there. When you ask the patient um, uh, to do all the, all the movements that we described, so abduction, um, external rotation, internal rotation, flex, flexion and extension, um, she's got good range of motion, but there is some discomfort, again, in the bicipital groove on external and internal rotation. Uh, the patient's neurovascularly intact and uh, the C-spine and the elbow are examining normally. So when you move on to your uh, special tests, the only abnormalities that you detect are you get a positive speeds test and Jorgensen's test, implying that there might be a long head of biceps pathology, and you get a positive O'Brien's test, suggesting that there might be a slap problem, um, but there's no instability at the shoulder. So again, just based on this, does anyone have any idea what might be happening? This is a, a, a tricky case. Um, but just in case anyone wants to ask anything at this point or, or post any comments. We've got someone saying working diagnosis impingement. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's the one that's come through. And there were a couple of answers, by the way, for the previous one. And that's looking back, people had said instability, dislocations, repetitive strain injury. So they had some ideas. I just missed them. But for this one, so that's far, great. only impingement has come through. So actually, when you do the impingement test for this patient, um, it's it's normal. There's no impingement. And also, when you tested abduction, um, there was no painful middle arc either. Um, so, so yeah, thanks for the comment. Um, Sorry, well, just one more for my jump off. Yes, we've got mm -hmm. calcification of supraspinatus tendon or repetitive strain injury. Okay. So, again, when you when you do your empty can test, there's no... Um, there's no discomfort there, which would suggest there's a problem with the supraspinatus. Um, also, sometimes if you've got some supraspinatus inflammation, you'll pick that up with your Hawkins test um, because um, it's putting impingement on that supraspinatus tendon. But both those tests are normal. So what's actually happening here is that the likely diagnosis is a, a slap tear. So that's a superior labral anterior posterior tear. So if you imagine this is your glenoid and this is the... Um, the, the labrum around the glenoid, this, this pink bit here. You've got your biceps, um, long head of biceps that inserts into the, um, into the sort of top of the, the glenoid there. So the tear happens along here. So it's the superior anterior posterior um, aspect here. And um, so, you know, a, a sort of simple initial tear might just be a little bit of fraying. Um, and then if the tear propagates, it can properly pull off. So the labrum can pull off here posteriorly and anteriorly, and um, the, the biceps um, can be pulled off as well. Um, so these, these generally seem to happen from overuse injuries in, in overhead athletes, or for example, painters and decorators, um, or they can happen from, from trauma um, in older patients usually. And patients complain of, um, of deep shoulder pain, um, bicipital tendonitis because it can affect the biceps. They also get clicking sometimes because of um, because of the, the, the tear sort of um, catching in the joint. And if it's a really significant tear and it really propagates um, quite significantly, you can get instability as well, because similarly to the last case, if you imagine, um, it's affecting um, that rim around the shoulder, which, which helps stabilize it. So if you suspect that someone's got a slap tear, again, check, check your local pathways because they can differ. But essentially, if it's associated with trauma, then refer to the acute shoulder clinic or your fracture clinic. Um, if the symptoms are mild or there's no associated trauma, then you can consider a, a routine referral to orthopedics, um, to the shoulder team. And they'll probably do an MRI or an MR arthrogram. And depending on the extent and the type of the tear, it may require arthroscopic repair. The slap lesions, like we said, generally in, in younger patients with a background of overhead activities, you can have an, a more acute on chronic presentation of symptoms. You can get mechanical symptoms, so sort of clicking and, and sort of catching pain, similar to that bucket handle meniscus um, tear that you can, you can get in the knee, which um, we'll talk about a bit later on. And patients can have instability symptoms, like I mentioned, depending on the, on the, degree, um, on the degree of the tear. Um, it's less than 5% of all shoulder injuries that we see, but it is important to recognize in general practice because you can imagine that some of these patients might sit in the community for a while. Um, Treating early generally um, is easier before you get further propagation of the tear. So that's why it's important to, to suspect it and, and pick these patients up. 
Um, and like we said, referral to an acute shoulder clinic or fracture clinic if there's associated trauma um, or routine clinic if symptoms are, are milder or there's no trauma. Um, so that's the shoulder. Um, let's try a few knee cases now. So you've got a 24-year-old um, netball player. Uh, she presents with right knee pain after jumping from a crouch position. She's unable to continue playing at the time, um, but she can weight bear even though it's uncomfortable. Uh, she's now complaining of an inability to get her leg fully straight. The injury is about 10 days old now. The swelling is better, but she's reporting that the knee is still bent and there are no other joint problems. So you bring her in and examine her. And again, you do your look, feel, move approach. So you start by, by um, looking with the patient standing. So you're looking for any deformity, malalignment, any swelling, any scars, skin changes, any obvious muscle wasting. And you're doing a gait assessment. So you ask the patient to walk and you examine her walking. And what you do pick up on gait assessment is that she's right. She does seem to have uh, be holding her knee in flexion, in slight flexion. So it's not fully straight. Um, so then you, you ask her to, to sit down on the examination couch. You um, bring her knee to about 90 degrees um, of flexion there. Um, and um, or actually, before you do that, um, if you ask her to extend, to just try and extend her, her knee as much as she as much as she can, um, you feel for an effusion. And remember, you're always comparing with the opposite side. So does the joint look swollen, and does it feel swollen compared to the other side? And you do think you can feel a bit of an effusion here when you do your your tap test and your um, and your patella sweep test. Um, so then you bring her into about 90 degrees of flexion at that point. You feel along the medial and lateral joint lines. You feel along the insertions of the medial collateral ligament and the lateral collateral ligament. You feel the tibial tuberosity and the popliteal fossa around the back. And she's she's generally a little bit sore, but you can't pick up anything that's very localized. So you then assess her range of, of movement and she's got good range of flexion. She can flex all the way to 135 degrees. But when you ask her to extend, um, she, she can't get to zero, so she can't fully straighten her leg. I just said minus five because some people do tend to be a little bit hyperextended and they can they can get to sort of minus five when, when they extend. But in this patient, she can't actually fully extend. She sort of seems to be um, stuck in a, in, a, in a flexion position when she tries to do that. Neurovascularly, she's intact and the hip and the ankle examine normally. Then we move on to some special tests. So we do the anterior draw test um, uh, to pick up, um, for example, an ACL injury and test for any laxity. And I normally do this just by putting my thumbs on the tibial tuberosity, reaching behind the knee and pulling forwards to see if there's any give. And remember, you're always comparing with the other side. A posterior draw is done in the same way. You're just pushing back. And then I do a Lachman's test as well um, for the ACL by just putting, asking the patient to um, go into about 30 degrees of flexion. I put one hand um, and hold the thigh. And then um, with the other hand, I do a, a, a sort of similar draw test just by um, pulling backwards and forwards to see if there's any give. So all that's normal. There's no, um, um, there's no abnormality when you do the draw test. You can also test for patella apprehension. Um, so that's if you think somebody might be sub, their patella might be subluxing um, in and out of joints. So you do this by putting the patient again in about 30 degrees of flexion, gently pushing on the patella. And again, just watch the patient because this, this could be uncomfortable for them. So just do it very gently, but push on the patella gently as they extend their knee and see if this makes them feel apprehensive. Um, but again, in this, in this case, everything's normal. Um, you then test the MCL and LCL um, ligaments. So what I do is I put a, a valgus strain um, on the ankle there, just that it opens out this compartment here and it puts strain on the medial collateral ligament and that can cause pain. And you might also feel laxity if, if there's any associated possible tear. Um, so if the patient reports pain when you're doing this test, always ask them where it's painful because if they point to here, then you think, fine, okay, I'm, I'm straining the MCL by doing this. So they could have an MCL sprain. But if they're pointing to there in the lateral joint line, it might be that because you're opening up this bit of the knee here, you're just putting pressure and closing that compartment. So you're actually squeezing the, the, the joint line and the meniscus in there. So it's really important to ask them where it's painful. Um, and then you do the lateral collateral ligament in a, in a similar way by putting a varus force, which puts strain on the lateral aspect of the knee. 
but when you do these tests, there's no pain and there's no laxity um, um, in your patient. So then you're testing the meniscus. So um, you may have heard of McMurray's tests in the past. Um, they seem to have gone out of favor. And um, I think that um, they're quite difficult to do. They can be quite uncomfortable for the patient. So I've not seen them done in practice very often, actually. Um, the Thessaly's test seems to be done a lot more now, which is where you get the patient to, to squat slightly on the affected knee and they rotate their body from one side to the other, which puts pressure on that knee and on the meniscus. And when your patient does this, she's reporting discomfort. So um, just based on the history and on the examination we've discussed, does anyone have any ideas of what might, might be happening in this patient? We've got um, meniscal tear, meniscal tear, quite a few meniscal tears coming in. Um, we've got patella problem. Um, but mainly it looks like meniscal tear, Vanessa. Only meniscus. Um, so bear in mind well, that when you're examining... Well, quadricep tendon, uh, quadricep tendon problem, but then you have meniscal tear, sorry. Just one of the... Meniscal tear mostly, yeah. That's great, thank you. So just remember that when you're examining the acute knee, an acutely painful and swollen knee um, can be challenging to examine um, because of the pain, because of the swelling, and, and special tests are difficult to perform. So you may need to rely on history and the mechanism of injury. And if you've got a high index of suspicion with a, in a clear history um, of significant mechanism of injury, um, then you know, you've got grounds to refer your patient. Don't just don't worry about not being able to examine them. So the likely diagnosis here is a, a locked knee, which um, is usually due to a displaced bucket handle tear of the medial meniscus. So if you imagine this is a cross section of the knee, this is your medial meniscus, this is your lateral meniscus, and this is what a bucket handle tear might look like. So you can see this would be the sort of bucket handle here. Um, and it can occur in isolation or with other damaged structures. Um, the medial meniscus typically gets caught when coming up from a deeply flexed knee position. You don't always get a large effusion um, when you examine these patients, and the locking can actually be intermittent as, um, as the tear sort of catches. Um, and gets caught in the joint. Other causes of a locked knee might be a large osteochondral defect or ACL rupture with impingement. Um, so if you ever have, if you come across a locked knee, always check your local pathways again, but these patients do need to be seen in the acute knee clinic. Um, if they're really, really uncomfortable and you haven't got access to a, an acute knee clinic where they can be seen quickly, um, then send them into A&E by all means. Um, and when they're seen in clinic, they'll likely have an MRI and they may need um, an arthroscopic repair if possible um, or debridement if, if the tear is not suitable um, for repair. So the locked knee um, should be referred urgently to acute knee clinic. And remember, a locked knee is an inability to fully extend the knee. You, they can still flex the knee, but they can't fully extend the knee. So that's what locking means. And bucket handle medial meniscal tears can cause intermittent locking, as we said. And so you should suspect this on the history, especially in younger sports people. And even if they're intermittently locking, they still warrant referral to the acute knee clinic. Um, displaced bucket handle tears have better outcomes if they're repaired early. And once the tears become degenerate, then they might only be suitable for resection. So it's important to pick these up early as well. Um, you may have come across the Ottawa rules before, um, especially if you've worked um, in A&E, for example. Um, so they're mentioned in the NICE guidelines and essentially um, um, it suggests getting an urgent x-ray or an A&E referral if you've got an injury to the knee and any of an inability to weight bear, inability to flex the knee to 90, tenderness to the fibula head, isolated patella tenderness or in a patient who's 55 or older. In my own experience, I've not really seen um, the Ottawa rules being used much in practice um, and a lot of the time in an acute injury, there might be so much swelling that you can't really do much examination. So um, just remember, if you're suspicious of a fracture or other significant um, injury um, to the knee uh, when you examine them, then use your clinical judgment and by all means have a low threshold for x-ray and for A&E referral. So other acute knee injury referrals um, to A&E worth bearing in mind are if, if your patient is unable to weight bear or they've got pain um, on weight bearing, following an injury, um, if there's immediate significant swelling following trauma where you're suspecting a hemarthrosis, 
if you're suspecting an ACL injury or an acute injury to collateral ligaments that's causing instability to the knee. And if they can't straight leg raise, I think somebody mentioned patella and quads tendons earlier. And so you ask your patient when you're examining them um, to straighten their leg um, and lift it off the examination bed. And if they can't do that, then you have to suspect a, a patella or quads tendon rupture. Any knee injury associated with foot drop as well, where you're thinking the perineal nerve might be damaged. And in essence, any high energy trauma with a high index of suspicion for injury, um, you refer them. So let's try another case now. So we've got a 45 year old runner presents with a six month history of right medial knee pain, no history of trauma, intermittent clicking sensations, but maintains a normal range of movement. Um, they think they had a previous arthroscopy to the other knee left um, several years ago, but they can't remember what for, and there's no other joint problems. So when you examine this patient, um, the only thing you really pick up is some, um, some pain in the medial um, joint line when you examine the knee, and they've got a positive um, Thessaly's test as well. So again, any thoughts about what might be happening in this case and how it might be different to the other case possibly? Just keep an eye out for comments. Mm, everyone's a bit stumped by the looks of it. Everything's a bit stumped. That's all right, we're going through it now. So that's, um, that's what this is for. So again, we are dealing with a possible um, meniscal injury here, but the likely diagnosis is a degenerate medial meniscus. So um, I showed you a bucket handle tear earlier. This is actually the lateral meniscus here, but just, um, just for visual purposes to show you what a degenerate tear might look like. It's just, sort of fraying yeah. around the meniscus here. So just jumping um, in, so, um, hmm. just jumping in. I think there's a bit of a delay in answering. So give credit to people as Emma said, degenerative meniscal tear. Um, Felicity said partial meniscal tear. So a few people did say that, just, um, just as I said that no one's said anything. Sure, no, that's great. Thank you. And thanks for commenting and, and well done on, on picking up um, a provisional diagnosis as well. Um, so what can happen with these tears is that displacing parts of the tear can cause mechanical symptoms like clicking and catching pain. They're much less likely to lock um, compared with bucket handle tears, but it, it can happen. You can get locking um, and it's common in older age groups. Um, you could also get a, a degenerate degenerate bucket handle tear that leads to a um you know that ends up looking like this um but it's unlikely from the history that that we've been given it probably wasn't a bucket handle tear originally in this case so if you see patients like this in primary care it's reasonable to get an x-ray and um, to try and assess the early arthritis um so remember you're looking for joint space narrowing subchondral sclerosis cysts osteophytes on an x-ray if you're looking for um in, for arthritis and You'd, in, either, in either case, whether it's early away or whether it's a medial meniscus tear, you're going to manage them similarly. Um, so, you know, they, they warrant a trial of conservative management and you can consider an MRI if you've got access to that in your practice or a routine referral if they have persisting symptoms after conservative treatment. So, um, let's talk just a little bit about OA versus meniscal tears. Um, so meniscal tears are actually quite commonly seen on MRIs over the age of 30, and sometimes they can just be incidental findings. Symptoms of a degenerate medial meniscus are usually more localized, um, and it's more sort of catching pain, pain on deep squatting. You can get swelling, you can get clicking, but it's less likely to lock compared to a, a bucket handle tear, as we said. Symptoms of osteoarthritis, they usually, it's usually more a dull or aching pain and not as localized as with a meniscal tear. Um, but you do get swelling, you can also get clicking and locking from loose bodies. So there's quite a bit of overlap between the two. And it's very common actually to have a mixed presentation because the natural progression of degenerate meniscal tears is that they can lead to OA. So essentially you're managing these in the same way really. They don't require acute referral. There's no um, uh, degenerate meniscal tears are not suitable for repair. Um, arthroscopic debridement is controversial if there's no mechanical symptoms. Um, so the initial management that you do for a patient with a medial meniscus degenerative tear is physiotherapy, weight reduction if appropriate, and a steroid injection um, can, can be tried as well. And again, that's very similar, like I said, to what you do with, with, um, with early arthritis. 
if somebody has persisting symptoms despite, conser uh, despite conservative management, then you can MRI them in practice if you've got access to that or refer them routinely um, for consideration of arthroscopic debridement, for example. So our last case now is, um, is a 35-year-old office worker with a history of an inversion injury to the right ankle about six months ago whilst crossing a stream. She was unable to continue the rest of her walk. She went to A&E, there was no fracture on the x-ray and she's, she's reporting that to you, you haven't seen the x-ray. So she does her own self-treatment at home and she reports ongoing pain in the right ankle since then and the pain causes the ankle to give way at times. So this is really important because Sometimes what happens is um, the patient uh, reports that the ankle feels unstable and due to that instability, they might go over on their ankle and then that might cause a flare up of pain. But that's not the case here. The patient is saying, I've actually got pain. Um, my ankle, I don't think it feels unstable. Um, but because of the pain, it causes, me, it causes the ankle to give way sometimes. So it's really important to differentiate pain and instability from the history. So she's a really keen hill walker. She's unable to do her usual walk since the injury due to her symptoms. So she comes to see you about this. She's got no other joint problems. So again, um, very similarly, we're doing a, a look, feel, move approach to examine the ankle. Normally start from standing, you're looking for any swelling, scars, deformity. You're looking at the arch um, to see whether it's you know, flat or, or, um, or um, a high arch um, or, or normal. Um, you're looking for knee hyperextension that can sometimes be secondary to ankle stiffness um, and you're looking at the patient walking as well. Um, so, and then you look from sitting, so you do a closer inspection on sitting to look for any ulceration, any callosities, anything that you can't see when they're standing up. So you look on the, um, you know, on the undersurface of the foot and the plantar surface. And then you, you examine them, so you feel for an effusion and actually the ankle does feel a little bit swollen in this case compared to the other side. And when you feel along the anterior joint line, she's saying that's where the pain is. It's not tender when you examine, doctor, but it, that's where the pain is. It's deep in there. And when you examine the medial and the, the lateral ligament complexes, just palpate around them, um, she's got some, some discomfort and tenderness around the lateral ligament complex. Um, there's no problem with the um, Achilles when you examine and um, when you examine the insertion point of tibialis posterior and just palpate along there, there's no discomfort there either. She's got good range of motion. Um, she's neurovascularly intact and you examine the knee and everything is normal. Um, so then you move on to some special tests at that point. So you, you just decide to, to check the Achilles a bit more thoroughly. So you can do a heel raise test um, um, and that's, that's normal. Um, and you do a Simmons test where you ask the patient to kneel on the bed, you squeeze the calf and the, the foot should plantar flex as you can see here compared to in this, in this photograph. Um, so it's suggesting that the Achilles is intact and, and working fine. You then do some tests for impingement at the ankle. And the way you do this is by um, holding the heel and putting your thumb in that sort of anterior lateral um, gutter region, um, just along the anterior joint line. And then with the other hand, um, you dorsiflex the foot um, passively. And as you do this, the patient reports pain. So again, she's saying the pain is deep in that joint. And then you test for instability. So you test your, your lateral ligament, so your ATFL and your CFL, and you do this with draw tests similar to the knee and similar to the shoulder. So you grab the heel and you, you pull forwards. And you do this with slight plantar flexion for the ATFL ligament and slight dorsiflexion for the CFL ligament. Um, and if you, if you pick up any um, laxity there, it's suggesting instability, but always remember um, to check with the opposite side. When you examine this patient, it doesn't feel unstable, but she's just she's she reports some pain. So she reports discomfort along the lateral ligament complex when you when you try and pull forwards. You also check the the medial um, deltoid ligament there by everting the foot to see if there's any any give there or any discomfort, but that feels normal. Um, so just at this stage, any any ideas about what might be happening um, in this case? Any thoughts or any questions? I'll uh, just give it a few seconds, just in the interest of time, Vanessa, but I'll wait if anyone says anything. Lateral ankle sprain. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, nothing else come through so far. That's but again, right. there might be a delay, but lateral ankle sprain. No problem. So, 
remember there's often little, little to find on examining the ankles sometimes. Um, draw tests can be difficult to do if the patient's in pain, so you can't always rely on them. And if laxity is picked up with a draw test and it's really obvious, then it's possible that both ligaments, both lateral ligaments, the ATFL and CFL are affected. Um, but always compare with the other side. So in this case, what we're suspecting um, might be happening is that there might be intra-articular pathology, such as an osteochondral defect, following that inversion injury that she had six months ago. So what happens is um, you can get a defect in the cartilage overlying the talus bone and in the subchondral bone. And this can be partially attached um, or loose, um, and it's causing that deep pain that she's describing in the ankle. And it's um, it's that's why she had that positive impingement test when we were putting when we were putting the foot in dorsiflexion that was catching and causing causing pain. Sometimes just the um, synovium being inflamed can cause um, can cause uh, pain and discomfort on an impingement test. You don't always see these on an X-ray, but it's worth getting an X-ray first. And if it's normal and you're still suspicious, then it would be reasonable to get an MRI. So you've got several reasonable pathways with this patient. She had an x-ray initially six months ago, but you haven't seen it. You're just basing your findings on what she's reporting. So it's reasonable to re-x-ray, see if you can see any obvious osteochondral defect. If you can't, then you can either refer to the foot and ankle clinic, or if you've got access to an MRI, you can request one and um, querying whether there is an osteochondral defect. Um, ultimately, these patients might require um, surgical intervention. So just lastly, just a few considerations. Um, in somebody who you see who's presented with an initial um, ankle sprain, if they have persistent pain and swelling following three to four months, then it is reasonable to, to x-ray if they haven't had an x-ray already, um, plus minus MRI, like I said, just being suspicious of those osteochondral defects. Um, and also, it might be that there is some significant ligament da damage to the lateral ligament complex. So the MRI would pick that up. You can consider physio before referring in some cases. It wouldn't be as helpful in the osteochondral defect case. But if you're suspecting that it's lateral ligament damage, um, then you can refer those to physio first. Other causes of persisting pain and swelling following an inversion injury. Um, so like I said, it might be the lateral ligament um, that might be damaged or torn, causing instability. They could have a fifth metatarsal fracture as well um, if their foot wasn't x-rayed, and it could be a Weber A fracture potentially. So just have an index of suspicion when you're seeing these patients. Um, and then just lastly, if you've got somebody presenting to you with recurrent sprains, um, it's really important to, to examine their feet and inspect closely because sometimes there can be some deformities associated with recurrent sprains. So for example, cava varus, um, which is where you've got a high arched uh, foot with the heel um, in a in a various position, so point, pointing inwards. So high arched foot, heel pointing inwards, and this can be associated with conditions like Charcot-Marie tooth, for example. So this would need referring to orthopedics. Um, the other deformity that's seen sometimes is a plano valgus foot, where you have a flat foot with um, with the heel actually pointing um, pointing sort of outwards a little in, in valgus. Um, and if you do a tiptoe test, um, normally you can see the heel points in on tiptoeing. So if it corrects, if you've got a heel that's pointing outwards, which corrects and points inwards um, as they tiptoe, um, then that's not fixed. But if it is fixed, then think, could it be an underlying abnormal fusion or coalition um, um, in, in the foot? So these would need referring as well to orthopedics. So just bear that in mind as somebody presenting with recurrent sprains. Um, and then we mentioned the Ottawa rules for the knee. There's also rules for the ankle. So again, it's just worth being familiar with them, but always use your clinical judgment um, when examining patients. If you feel that somebody has, has a fracture, then by all means get an X-ray. Um, and just the Bayton score that I mentioned for laxity. Um, again, I know that we're um, just running a bit, um, a bit late. So, uh, you know, just to make you aware of it quickly, that if you're, if you're assessing somebody and you think they might be generally hypermobile, then um, you can do a, a Baton score on them. And if they score four um, out of nine, then um, they, they can be classed as, having, um, as being generally hypermobile. And these patients generally, um, if they're referred to physio as a first line, that's, um, um, that's sort of a good first step um, for these patients who are generally lax. Um, that's everything. Um, it's a lot to run through and we've <laughs> gone through it quite quickly, but hopefully it's given you an overview 
um, of some important cases to be aware of in general practice. Um, are there any questions at this point? Anything anyone wants to ask at all? Uh, yeah, firstly, really good. Thanks, Vanessa. That was um, clear, crisp, to the point, lots of info, but hopefully covered in a way that's very relatable to primary care. I think with MSK, there's, there's never a limit, really, in terms of how far you can go and how many tests you can talk about and how many small findings you can come up with. But to, to get it succinct into how what you can do in your you know your 10 or 12 minutes of primary care is is um is important and those key standout findings that you can't afford to miss are really key isn't it when you uh, you're thinking about msk in primary care so i think it was really really good getting some um some positive comments coming through thank you so much so useful uh, very clear uh, succinct to the point um yeah really good there are some questions vanessa but what if it's okay with you i'll probably get them just transferred across to yours just in the interest of time um, yeah, but course, there are some absolutely. Yeah. Ones. I think some people picking up on a few key queries that uh, are individual, which would be quite useful just to to knock on the head if you can uh, after we finish. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But yeah, brilliant presentation. Um, any chance is it going to be watched back? So yes, um, this will go up on YouTube probably in the next week or so, so you can watch this back and pause it and look at all the slides in detail. Uh, if you like, someone asking for the slides itself, uh, maybe we can we can look at um, somehow getting this across to you at some point. But um, but I'll have a chat with Vanessa about that afterwards. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Pooja. No, fabulous talk, Vanessa. Lots of comments coming through. Brilliant presentation. Um, made MSK so much more simpler. In fact, um, <laughs> people are now asking if there's any training courses for MSK presentations for GP trainees. So uh, <laughs> uh, definitely lots of um, really good. Really good. comments. So thank you for explaining. I've learned loads as well. So I'll forward on the questions. Um, but thank you so much for taking time out to explain that um, to everyone today. Yeah. And just as good, and I've had a, a question coming about this. Did you mention the stats webinars? Yes, you can go back on YouTube and you'll find Dr. Vanessa's AKT stats webinar for the October exam that, that we did. Um, I think it was around six weeks before the exam. And we plan to do another one before the January exam as well. So. Um, that's something that's worth looking out for because uh, MSK is one of uh, Dr. Vanessa's strong points, but stats is also a super strong point for her as well. So um, she's going to be doing hopefully some of that to, later on. But yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa. We, we're going to uh, jump on, but um, thanks for your time. And, and, and like I said, we'll forward some of those on, um, those queries on as well. Thank you so much. I'll have a look at those questions. And thanks for your time, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Vanessa. Oh, <laughs>